A very good morning or afternoon, as the case may be, depending on the country you're based in. And welcome to this Fintelect and Asian Bankers Association webinar on managing AML risk, operations, and continuity during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Shirish Patak. I work at Fintelect, and I will be your host today for this webinar. At the outset, let me thank the Asian Bankers Association for partnering again with us for this webinar. In light of the global situation, we have decided to increase our webinar schedule from once a quarter to once a month, and I hope this will add value to ABA members across Asia. Today, we have two guest speakers, Guy Shepard and Subir Khanna. Guy is the head of Asia-Pacific Financial Crime, Intelligence, and Cyber at SWIFT, and Subir is partner at KPMG India's Forensic Practice. Both of them are available on LinkedIn, and I would urge you to connect with them after the call should you wish to get some more advice from them. The topic for today's webinar is a bit ambitious, since this is the first time in recent years that the world is going through a situation like this. And really, all of us are still learning and trying to grapple with the true impact of this pandemic on our businesses, customers, partners, working situation, and our personal lives. Having said that, it is far better to try and grapple with the situation in a forward-looking manner rather than being fatalistic. And it is with this view that we decided to host this webinar. So while we may not have all the answers, I believe it is important to share information within the Fintelect and ABA community and beyond, and keep the conversation going in the hope that we will all stay motivated through this crisis and come out of it with as few scars as possible. In this webinar today, I will ask our guest speakers to share their thoughts on what are the practical difficulties that banks have been facing and are they seeing any common solutions that may be emerging or have emerged, especially from countries that have undergone the entire cycle of the pandemic? In the last few weeks, banks have presumably built up a backlog of transaction monitoring cases due to lower availability of staff and access to the required technology from home working situations. It is also likely that a large number of new accounts opened may have been done virtually without field verification visits and the required level of due diligence that is done normally. So we will discuss the likelihood of banks being forced, being faced with increased regulatory risk due to challenges in customer due diligence, transaction monitoring, and meeting reporting timelines, as well as the approach that we expect from regulators. shift due to tough economic conditions and cover some of the macroeconomic implications of the pandemic on AML CFT compliance. We will attempt to take questions from the audience at the end of the webinar. However, online platforms, including this one, are facing severe stress of overload at this point of time. And just in case it doesn't work out logistically, please email your questions to contact at fintelect.com and we will try our best to get our guest speakers to answer questions offline for you via email later. Suvir and Guy, thanks so much for joining us at this webinar. It is indeed a pleasure to have you here. Let me start off this conversation by asking Guy Shepard the first question. All right, Guy, uh, let me ask you, uh, what do you think are the practical difficulties that your banking customers have been facing over the past few days? And in your conversations with them, are you seeing any sort of common solutions that may be emerging or have already emerged, especially from countries such as Singapore, where containment has been successful? Um, sure, Suresh. Um, so I think I think the situation obviously differs dramatically on a country by country basis. Um, and I think if we t look at this at a more kind of macro level, um, it's very clear that um, kind of early adoption of uh, tighter border controls um, and social containment has obviously spread the, uh, the growth of the curve. Um, you mentioned Singapore in your, um, uh, in, in your question, and I think, you know, that's really been shown to be an example of where um, coordinated, um, uh, centralised social distancing, um, restrictions on borders has really helped. Um, but I think to the kind of practical difficulties, these are things that everyone will be facing. Um, that 
um, pretty much every uh, financial institution I've spoken to has got um, a BCP or business continuity planning in place. So teams are being split uh, sort of 50-50 um, to either work from home and then um, so you a lot of them are doing two weeks working from home and then they would rotate with the other half of the team that were working in the office. Um, so I think that's one very kind of practical solution. Um, other companies have adopted in um, their entire workforce to work from home, um, aside from critical um, staff, be they IT support or or some of the operations guys. I think the challenge is, um, I don't think we actually really know the true extent of the challenges yet. Um, the obvious ones are the economic slowdown, um, you know, particular industry verticals, travel, tourism, uh, leisure have been hit, I think, um, most dramatically. But, you know, many of the clients that I'm talking to um, are having to reforecast almost on a biweekly basis as to how many negative percentage points um, they're looking at from an overall revenue perspective, uh, be it in payments, be it in trade. Um, you know, I, 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 we're not going to realise the true um, economic impact um, actually for quite some time. Thanks. Thanks, Guy, for sharing that. So, Suvir, what are the practical difficulties that your customers have been facing? And in your conversations with them, are you seeing any common solutions that may be emerging or have already emerged? Yeah, so thanks, Shirish, for that question. Actually, if we look at financial crime broadly, and uh, what I mean by the financial crime is fraud, AML, sanctions, uh, bribery, corruption, and, uh, you know, capital markets, uh, uh, front running insider trading so if i look at f broadly financial crime risk so there are there are impact broadly from five aspects the first being on the risk typologies which are being looked at right so there are new typologies which are coming into play so for example many covid related internet domains are getting uh, formed through which you see uh, either cyber attacks or you see some kind of scams going on. Uh, and all the regulators actually have put out advisories on their websites, either FinCEN or Austrac or, or others. So really the typologies with respect to retail banking kind of fraud are clearly at play and analytics and detection scenarios are needed. Similarly, when you look at typologies from, say, from a capital market standpoint, when you work from home and trading from home, you will see spurts from an insider trading front running kind of thing. So clearly that is one area, you know, at a high level. Second is how do you look at COVID related, uh, you know, financial crime strategy to tackle it? Because clearly business focus is important because that is the existence. But at the same time, you have to tackle the risk as well. Uh, so clearly in the downtime, in the lockdown time, what are the training awareness internally and also for the customers externally? I think that's an important. What is how is management looking at controls? in in this scenario also becomes important and the operational resilience uh, is tested so i think uh, having a clear uh, risk strategy where the financial crime risk in, is an integral part is is important thirdly i would say what are the technology solutions we already have in our stack because the consumer behaviors are changing uh, you know you see a, a huge spurt in the voice based contact programs and many institutions have a callback mechanism as well. Now, this callback mechanism is being misused to, you know, uh, really call vulnerable customers and extract your pound of flesh. So clearly, how do you use technology solutions to handle this uh, spurt is uh, critical. Fourth is uh, very focused on operational resilience. Now, given operational teams, second line of defense would come under tremendous pressure beyond the first line. Clearly, the customer contact is just not vital from a standpoint of managing the risk, but also to create awareness because customers at this point of time are also, you know, trying to 
figure out ways and means of um, continuing their business operations, their livelihood. So I think that is an important con uh, component. And last but not the least, I think uh, given the you know um, the the data the data patterns will all of a sudden change. So the factors which were at play in terms of initially through which the routines were being run, fraud losses were being monitored, the models which were being tested, now they will go uh, undergo change. And uh, you know, false positives of a different time will start to come in. So really looking at that element becomes critical because if you have some issues going through your systems, going through customer accounts, ultimately you are responsible for it. So how do you look at that? becomes important. So at a high level, Sarish, I think these are the key points which I believe institutions may want to consider uh, in this um, in this new era of lockdown, working from home, uh, business continuity uh, across the world. So Subir, on the regulatory side, uh, do you expect yeah that uh, you know since uh, banks will be faced with an increased regulatory risk because of challenges in monitoring and maybe some backlogs which may happen uh, to meet some of the reporting timelines and do you expect that you know regulators therefore are likely to take uh, maybe a more lenient approach uh, towards banks do you have you seen any evidence of that uh, so far and in the same uh, thread uh, what would your advice to even regulators be in these trying times sure uh... I think uh, you know, as as situation is evolving, uh, there are some communications coming in from the regulators as well. So, for example, uh, FinCEN has come out with some guidance on its website where they have talked about uh, if uh, organizations feel that uh, there could be impact on their reporting requirements or if they have a concern about any potential delays uh, in its ability to file filings under BSA, uh, they should contact FinCEN, okay? And I mean, a phone number and an email ID has been given on, a, on the FinCEN uh, website, okay? Uh, similarly, Austrac has also uh, come out with uh, not giving a definitive answer that you can delay filing, but actually talking about that they themselves are working with the reduced uh, workforce, uh, talking about their own business continuity plan, uh, and and they have also you know very briefly touched upon uh, that uh, we will constructively work with you to manage the risk during the disruption period, including your reporting obligations. So clearly, uh, I think the regulators have. Uh, you know, shown the white flag, they have kind of given a perspective that they will be flexible, uh, but clearly they have not uh, given a black or white answer. And uh, that is rightly so, because the moment you say your obligations are not there or you have a longer time period, you know, the focus all of a sudden will go away from, uh, from that standpoint. So I think that, in my mind, yeah. is... Uh, and clear evidence that regulators are on the right track. Uh, similarly, if you look at from an India standpoint, may not be directly for banks. But essentially, you know, uh, finance minister has also given you know some some <clears throat> flexibility with respect to filings under income tax or you know stock exchange. Uh, SEBI has also come out with some guidance around for further delays. Uh, in terms of filing. So I think these aspects really uh, indicate that there is a flexibility in the mind of regulator. Guy, do you think banks will be faced with an increased regulatory risk due to challenges in monitoring and meeting defined reporting timelines? Yeah, I think almost certainly. I think, you know, to lead on from the previous question, um, I think, you know, the business as usual um, approaches are, are going to be much more cumbersome. Um, you know, whether you have split teams, people working from home, people working remotely, you know, just the usual overhead of um, sort of timely and comprehensive collection of internal uh, reporting material for the safety and soundness of, of, of whatever it is that you are reporting on. It's just going to be, by definition, a lot more challenging. Um, I think the cost of it um, is going to go up because it is going to be a lot more intensive. Um, 
And I think it's just going to make things a lot more difficult for compliance teams as your ability to react um, you know, and query anything you may find from across the business is going to be that much slower um, and is going to be hampered by some of the organisational disruption um, that everyone is experiencing. Um, you know, I, I, I can't see any reality where this is going to be the same or easier. Right. And and do you think regulators will actually uh, and maybe take a more lenient approach towards these timelines? <laughs> Have you had any evidence of it so far? And uh, you know what what would your advice to regulators be in this scenario? Um, okay. Well, I think there's two ways to answer this question. So I would say charitably, um, I'm assuming the regulatory institu institutions, um, being it the Reserve Bank of India or MAS or HKMA. They have the same levels of um, uh, of, of human challenge um, that the banks themselves are having. So um, I would assume and, and I've actually had some meetings um, with the local regulator here uh, more recently. Um, and I think it's safe to say that wherever possible, they, of course, are going to try and maintain the status quo in terms of the um, uh, the supervisory schedule. Um, in terms of the kind of core activities that they would be um, that they would be looking for the FIs to report on. But I think it's fairly safe to say that, um, for example, um, some of the, uh, I would say, more intrusive thematic reviews um, or and certainly a lot of the supervisory kind of soup tech um, work has been, I think, temporarily suspended. Um, you know, because they're looking to focus as best they can um, on maintaining the, the core elements of the regulatory environment, which I think, you know, should really mirror what the bank's financial crime teams themselves are doing, um, where they may not be looking at any kind of technology upgrades right now or new projects, new hires, for example. Everyone is just doing the best they can to keep the lights running. Um, and I think it's going to be quite interesting if you have um, regulatory on-site inspection scheduled as to how they would actually do that. Um, you know, all of those, I think, quite sensibly have been, you know, have been pushed back. Um, I think the other way to answer this less charitably is, you know, there is going to be a fairly hard line that there are well-known um, uh, legislative requirements that the banks, regardless of the circumstance, are going to have to adhere to. I think there is going to be some flexibility um, because, you know, every regulatory um, to regulated um, uh, relationship that I've seen, you know, there is usually some give and take and some degree of, um, I think, proportionality. Um, but if you think you're going to get kind of indefinite extensions, I think you're I think you're going to be very, very um, uh, disappointed. Um, but I think it's safe to say that the scope is going to be much more limited. Um, and I think what my advice to those listening to this would be, um, everyone at the moment is on a kind of go slow um, or, you know, trying to reduce the um, infection curve um, and speed of COVID-19. The assumption, I think, that we're all looking to what's happened in China is that you know, this will peter out at some stage later in the year. So that would imply um, that in potentially Q4, you know, Q3, Q4, Q1 maybe um, of 2021, um, you know, regulatory on-site inspections, there's going to be a lot of stuff that's suddenly going to be released from the, uh, the pipe, so to speak, if it's been blocked. Um, so there may be a very, very uh, hectic, um, um, and uh, timeline aggressive Q4 or Q3. Right. So we, you've done a lot of work uh, over the last many years on the whole online uh, financial crime and cyber fraud. Uh, there's also been a lot of talk in the last few days that uh, online fraud is likely to increase because of this uh, outbreak. Uh, do you agree yeah. with that? And do you think banks are well prepared? And what would your advice to them to be uh, to them be to help them really mitigate this perceived increased risk. So um, 
I think there is two parts to it. And before coming to the banks, I will actually come to the consumers. I think uh, customer awareness is very critical in this time period. And I think banks have started doing this. And there are messages which I see on social media already floating around. But looking at, uh, you know, uh, work, the bank's financial risk teams or, you know, operational risk team working with, with hand tied behind their back uh, while in a boxing match, I think it's, a, it's going to be a challenging situation uh, because uh, how do you tackle with any increased spurt? Because uh, many other issues are also to be tackled. So I think it will be... Uh, interesting uh, situation uh, to deal with a more challenging situation to deal with but i wouldn't say that the banks aren't prepared because clearly if you look at let's say you know christmas time there is a online spurt of activities people are doing shopping but at the same time banks are working at a reduced capacity uh, you know everybody wants to take a holiday at the same time so so it's not that uh, you know um, organizations are not totally prepared uh, but yes, is the uh, preparation at, you know, 10 on 10, I would say that that may uh, be tested in these times. Right. But clearly we have started seeing some incidents of cyber, uh, cyber frauds or, or uh, issues arising out of it. So we are seeing increased investigative work on that part uh, coming in uh, to us. Right, right. All right. Guy, I'd like to get some of your thoughts in the online and cyber. There are several advisories that suggest that the evidence, the incidence of online fraud is likely to increase manifold during this outbreak. Do you think banks are well prepared and what are partners like SWIFT doing to help mitigate this perceived increased risk? Yeah, I think um, almost certainly um, uh, fraudsters, unfortunately, um, take advantage of um, of any perceived weakness in the system. Um, and this is no different. And um, we've already seen, um, particularly with some of the kind of um, uh, cyber intrusion uh, specific activities, um, you know, their, their method of entry is usually um, email phishing campaigns using um, relevant social engineering. And unfortunately, a number of um, corporate um, uh, customers, as well as um, a few banks have already reported um, uh, a marked increase in the number of um, phishing campaigns targeting employees to gain their credentials, you know, under the cover of um, COVID-19 updates from, um, you know, the operations center or uh, from human resources, um, updating contingency plans, you know, please cl click this link. Um, so, and then I think what what really sickens me is um, there's also been um, um, a series of uh, cyber attacks and attempted hacks of actual um, healthcare providers over in Western Europe um, who've reported a surge in the increase of intrusions. Um, I think in terms of what SWIFT is doing about this, um, we're really just sort of as best we can under the circumstances, you know, maintaining a fairly hard line with um, uh, strategic activities that are market wide, like the customer security program, um, re and continuing to reinforce the message, although I would say not in an event format, but more of a one on one approach, um, you know, around the importance of um, uh, preventative technology and solutions um, to counter the threat. Um, and I think the, the most obvious, the most tangible example of that is the work that the, um, uh, the team working for me have been doing um, in terms of positioning the payment control solutions, which, um, you know, is really an additional set of controls in the SWIFT network um, that would stop or block um, a fraudulent payment being sent on behalf of your institution. Um, and in some cases, these have already been seen where they've been deployed um, to prevent um, uh, on the brighter side, um, human error um, in sending duplicate messages and in one or two suspected cases as well. So for us, it's really business as usual, although there's really a kind of new twist to the tail um, in terms of how cyber criminals are trying to penetrate um, uh, financial institutions in particular, um, which is, you know, obviously humanity at its worst. 
Right, absolutely. And uh, Subir, uh, you know, on the whole business versus compliance uh, issue, uh, do you think that compliance is now likely to be under more pressure from business as the uh, economic condition maybe will stay depressed for some time? And given that there might be more NPS coming in for banks, do you think that credit risk will really occupy much more mind share in the bank top management rather than uh, issues related to AML safety compliance? Uh, what is your view on this? So I think existence is the first thing now. Uh, and uh, all the organizations, I mean, if you look at from a banking standpoint, stress testing scenarios will kick in now and all the institutions would be looking at, you know, capital deployment and uh, capital utilization. On the, on the other hand, uh, you know, repayments may uh, become slow. Uh, and which could in turn lead to non-performing assets uh, or bad loans. Uh, there, I have been following some regulators uh, talking about, you know, some flexibility in the provisioning norms, but nothing has come out uh, specifically. But one thing is for sure that the bottom lines will get impacted. Uh, there will be significant pressure on generating top line, and hence any discretionary spend will have its own limitation. Uh, so if there are compliance budgets which are approved where you can't really touch those budgets, I don't think so anything will happen there. But yes, if there is any discretionary spend plan, uh, that may be a, a, a challenge go forward. So yes, uh, to answer your question in our shell, I do see some budget pressures coming on AML CFT kind of uh, uh, compliance uh, requirements but that will be used as an opportunity by the launderers and already we are seeing organization like RUSI of UK talking about uh, increased spurt of organized crime groups trying to uh, you know uh, take advantage of the situation. Uh, Guy coming to the business versus compliance angle uh, mm -hmm. Do you think compliance is likely to be under more pressure from business as the economic conditions remain depressed? Uh, at the same time, we also know that there's possibly going to be um, a higher focus on credit risk because of uh, mm. maybe NPAs coming into the system. So how do you think senior management or the board will react to this particular challenge? I think this is a, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, you know, obviously with a, an economic downturn, we all know it's going to be bad. I think um, I, I'm personally not um, uh, a market analyst. I don't know how bad. I think there are some really tough, um, uh, some tough decisions ahead uh, for compliance departments um, and businesses because there are going to be a large number of customers that are going to that are going to default um, uh, in the you know in certain industries. I think the impact of this is going to be quite catastrophic. I think we're already starting to see um, governments making a lot of noise about bailouts of um, specific industries. I think we will see, um, in some cases, the need for banks themselves to be bailed out. And I think the pressure is going to be that as when, if, um, if I'm being um, you know, very optimistic about this, uh, the situation lessens and business globally is starting to um, find its feet again. Um, I think there's going to be increasing increasing uh, pressure on compliance departments to downplay um, red flags and risk to maintain relationships, um, because I think we are all going to be rather desperate to um, to generate income in whichever format. Um, and I, I guess my advice on this is um, there may be uh, a very dramatic change in risk appetite in terms of the profile of customers. Um, that banks are still willing to um, to underwrite to maintain accounts for, um, and I think on the other side we may see um, another wave of kind of global retrenchment where some of the larger banks are going to continue to withdraw um, from less profitable markets, and that de minimis level of of kind of relationship profitability or um, or that barrier to staying in a market I think is going to go up so much more because. Every institution, big or small, is going to be under um, significant pressure um, in terms of their bottom line. 
And I think those borderline relationships are going to be the first wave of casualties um, because I think um, everyone is going to be looking at the, um, the business line item profitability with renewed scrutiny, um, whether the red flag is profit based, whether it is, as you said, um, uh, from a credit risk perspective um, or whether it is, you know, um, more traditional compliance based red flags, although I would strongly reiterate um, that yes as a, a compliance professional you need to be able, you need to be business savvy um, you need to be able to translate legislation um, into actionable guidelines for the business um, I still think of course there are some hard limits and hard nos that regardless of the size of the prize um, you know if there is sanctions risk if there is very clear um, uh, or, or unpalatable money laundering risk, um, I would hope and I would urge people to to maintain a hard line on that, because regardless of the short term gain, um, you know, the, the regulatory penalty for that is going to be severe. Right. Uh, so, we, uh, you know, another last question for you. Uh, what are your views and what do you think are, let's say, the microeconomic implications of the pandemic? Uh, it may actually have a material impact on some of the AML programs of banks uh, or operations of banks. So I think uh, uh, if we look at the press release coming from uh, Rossi, uh, one of the biggest uh, issues which we are looking at is uh, human smuggling across borders as borders get sealed. Uh, and uh, and uh, the trafficking per se uh, comes to a halt, it becomes more rewarding if you're able to do any of these activities. So uh, typically with respect to the situation in Venezuela, one of the bigger issues which we are seeing is, uh, you know, human trafficking from Honduras increasing uh, with respect to issues in Mexico, uh, you know, some of the cartels trying to uh, smuggle some chemicals so that, you know, some of, uh, uh, these new products can be made. So, so we really see those kind of situations evolving. Even in Hong Kong, there were, you know, a, a, a crime group hijacked delivery trucks full of uh, toilet rolls. So, you know, for for example, to manage, uh, you know, to make a killing in in terms of the profitability. So, really, these are the issues which we see. Uh, things will evolve. Uh, so, so the banks and the institutions will need to be really prepared. Uh, some of the action, uh, actions which could be looked at, you know, how do you deal with dormant account, suspicious accounts in the past, which have, you know, increased activity, especially, you know, uh, uh, though the trade has stopped, but let's say trade-based uh, remittances are still continuing. So I think some of these things would be important to look at uh, as the situation evolves. Interestingly, on a lighter note, some of the uh, police departments in US and even in Ireland have put out social media posts requesting criminals not to indulge in their activities till the time the lockdown is continuing and they can come back to their criminal behavior after <laughs> things stabilize. So, so that's all, also on a lighter note, you know, humanitarian appeals of police authorities to criminals. So that's, that's uh, interesting you know, uh, collaboration uh, on a different level. Right, right. Right. <clears throat> Gav, what do you think are the macroeconomic implications of this pandemic? You know, that may be material for AML, CFT programs or mm -hmm. operations banks? I think I, I gave this question some thought, actually. Um, and I was reading an interesting article the other day around what um, people theorize the world will be like after COVID-19. Um, and there are some actually quite, I think, relevant um, kind of socioeconomic implications. I think one of the obvious things is I think a lot of I think a lot of companies have found their ability to enable entire workforces to to work remotely. You know, there haven't been contingencies. And I speak, for example, for Swift, we've had to do some very rapid investment because we didn't really have a plan. And our current plan is that aside from essential staff, everybody 
on the planet is working from home, regardless of the situation in the country. So I, I think there will be I think there will be a renewed and longer term, um, I think, more comfort with uh, remote working, which I think is positive for um, work life balance, um, for um, um, either uh, for, for people under different circumstances like um, uh, new mothers returning to the workforce, etc. I think there's going to be a renewed understanding of a working from home, working remote capability. And I think most companies will be um, a lot more open to that arrangement, which I think is very positive. I think from an AML perspective, um, having um, companies now more comfortable with remote workers, there need to be reviews of um, sort of um, uh, access and privileges within your workforce, how you manage sensitive data, as I think more often than not now after this um, virus has, has broken down, I think there will be a greater number of people accessing sensitive data or the need to have access to extremely sensitive um, systems and controls, you know, in, in coffee shops or working from home. So I think that's one. I think the second is from an uh, economic perspective, we will almost certainly see, I think, um, in the travel industry, there is going to be, I think, much more of a survivalist strategy. And we will see a lot of these large, um, uh, particularly, for example, in the airline industry, which in some parts of the world is quite, quite fragmented. I think you'll see um, a few dominant players um, uh, certainly you know, come out of that. Um, and I think that is going to be so hard hit for some time. The way that we expect to do business with one another may change. Um, and I think here in Asia, um, you know, this is still a very um, relationship driven face to face um, uh, face to face time is, is ex an extremely important component of building trust and building longer standing relationships. Um, and I think increasingly, uh, because of this is going to go on for some time, we will learn the lesson that actually, um, you know, uh, we don't necessarily need to send our RMs to, um, you know, to Nigeria or Ghana on such a regular basis for this. So I think the nature of us doing business will change. Um, I think increasingly, I mean, some of the other things that came out of this are quite interesting as well um, in terms of. I think a very positive thing um, is that we are kind of refocusing as a species. Um, this, was, this was quite a sort of intellectual article about, you know, what matters to us in terms of social touch points, relationships. Um, so I think from a um, uh, from an AML perspective, there should be, I think, a renewed belief um, in the use of technology. Um, a kind of freeing up of the workforce and a need to have a structure that can support individuals regardless of whether they're in the office or not. I think increasingly there is going to be a wave of um, heightened inspection or heightened due diligence on customers that will have been onboarded remotely, I guess, if you follow that thought process through, um, through the kind of viral outbreak uh, months. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we're in for quite a shake up um, in terms of some of the established brands that we're used to seeing um, and um, a continued period of economic downturn. Um, and I'm hoping that we take the positive from this as an industry um, and look to implement processes that enable us to work um, in a more flexible manner with customers not necessarily present, i.e., you know, not walking into a branch. Um, I think those are going to be the renewed kind of focal points post COVID-19. Um, and I think particularly for institutions where, you know, your online banking portal um, may not be uh, that user friendly or that intuitive um, uh, or even give you as broad an access as a customer would have if they walked into a branch. I think those are institutions whose business is, is predictably going to suffer the most. Um, and I think out off the back of this, a lot of you listening on this WebEx should be giving very serious thought to um, how well your DR, so your disaster recovery and contingency plans that you had, how well they have coped. I think there is going to be a very serious audit process and reflection 
um, of how well the institution has managed to pivot under these new circumstances. I think the way that we establish trust, build relationships, I think that is going to um, take a change. Um, I don't think there's going to be the same emphasis on the face to face for sure. Um, and I think there will be significant investments um, or holes in different institutions, um, kind of technology stacks um, that should facilitate, you know, greater bandwidth, um, better controls, better data privacy uh, for a workforce. Um, and I think the way that we're going to focus on doing business is going to change quite dramatically. Thanks. Thanks, Guy and Suveer for sharing your thoughts with the participants. We have a few minutes of questions now. Thanks, Guy and Subir. We do have a few minutes for questions now. There is one question which has come in specifically for Guy. Um, the question goes, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, have transactions globally increased compared to the usual? If yes, can you give any approximate percentage? Guy, that question is for you. Uh, can you hear us? Sorry, Suresh, who, who was that question for? Was that for me? Yes, that was for you. Uh, should I repeat that? Uh, Would you mind? Sorry, yeah, it, it, yes, so it broke up a second there. No problem. So the question says, during the pandemic, have transactions globally increased compared to the usual? If yes, is there any approximate percentage that you can share? Is there an approximate percentage? Sorry, it's really crackly on the line. Is there an approximate percentage that I can share in terms of increases or down or decreases in transaction volumes? Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Um, I think as uh, some, as an overview and without getting into country specifics, um, the the interesting dynamic is that in periods of market volatility. Uh, messaging over the SWIFT network actually increases. So we see large numbers of um, liquidity conciliations. You see large numbers of assets being moved around, an increased focus on some of the trade um, negotiations, etc. And overall, actually, payment traffic we see increasing, although to the other side of the coin is increasingly we see RMA relationships under greater scrutiny. And the preference in many of these cases is to streamline this new activity through preferred uh, network partners. To give you right. an example, um, securities have recorded a growth of 42% versus what we had internally forecasted as 7%. And that is directly due to um, market volatility from COVID-19. Right. Uh, there's another question which uh, either Suveer or Guy, either of you can take, um, and that says, uh, how do you see global trade in the near future when chances are there that countries will be closing their borders due to the pandemic? Uh, Sirish, can you... How do I think... What is the impact on trade? Yes, it's, it's really unclear this line. What's the impact on trade from, from countries closing their borders? That's right. I don't know how I could answer that specifically, to be honest, without stating some very obvious facts. But I think it, it's going to be very challenging. Um, and a lot of the goods flow 
uh, are going, is going to be incredibly impacted. Um, I think uh, for trade, we're going to see a marked downturn for sure. Uh, <clears throat> Sirish, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, okay. Can, yeah. Yes, I think what Guy is saying is perfectly correct uh, in terms of trade flows. But if you divide the trade flows into uh, goods uh, versus services, I think to a certain extent services uh, can be still delivered. So if you're considering in trade flow services, uh, there could still be a possibility that you see business ongoing uh, with with some uh, downturn and as lockdown continues gradually this will become bau so you can actually see a ramp up as well uh, but this is for you know for times to come but clearly on the given the borders will be sealed uh, you will see more and more goods not flowing in and uh, i was reading some statistics around ships uh, ships are stuck all over the world uh, because of which uh, you know the goods flows are getting impacted uh, and and it's leading to huge costs uh, for transporters as well so i think uh, that's my take on this right thanks uh, subir subir one more question which probably uh, you are well placed to answer um, it says with employees working from home banks expose themselves to unknown risk because employees are behind beyond the firewall uh, how do you contain this risk yeah so i think uh, it's not that all applications are beyond the firewall uh, of course you are not in the office premises but a lot of uh, uh, applications work on uh, you know um, uh, on vpn and it is within the organization's uh, setup so give to give uh, example in terms of uh, uh, some of the banks, I know that you do uh, log in from home, but still you are working on the company machine. You're still working on the company network and you can't, uh, you know, uh, from a da uh, data leakage prevention policy standpoint, you can't really shift data out from the company network or, or, or the organization's laptop. Of course, clearly you can have somebody sitting next to you and see uh stuff on your screens but that is where trust really comes into picture uh so of course there are some compromises that you will be making uh, uh but we do see some investigative work in the last week 10 days coming in where this trust is getting breached so yes there is an unknown risk but uh, organizations do have contingency plans and hopefully if they are working then the risk is mitigated but not eliminated Right. Guy, do you have any uh, comment on this question? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I think all of this is, I think when it comes to this remote aspect, it, it's about thinking through some of the logical and practical challenges. So without wanting to repeat what's already been, uh, been said, you know, think about additional assistance for help desk teams, right? They're, the burden that they're going to have is going to be exponentially larger. They, need, they may need refreshers on policies, training, tools, that sort of stuff to in, um, in terms of the increased number of requests they would get, um, particularly around um, uh, uh, with a real focus on things like um, additional, uh, you know, login issues, password, forgotten passwords, you know, two or four factor authentication. Um, and similarly to, you know, to the point made about people being able to see your laptop screen if you're sitting in a, um, an open coffee shop, you're also going to have challenges like people trying to print sensitive documents, contracts, um, and if you don't have a printer at home, you're going to go to a print shop, right? Um, and I think that's going to that's going to create some challenges. Um, and I think there is a real need to uh, renew people's attention um, to the fact that um, unfortunately, no matter how nicely we ask, the cyber criminals aren't going to take a break. They're going to use this um, as uh, uh, an added vulnerability um, for social engineering um, email phishing scams, as well as the fact um, that they know that most financial institutions will be on BCP, so will be understaffed, um, which is what we've already seen um, on the SWIFT network. So you know when you have these sorts of things the employees are the weakest or the strongest link and it's always good to send refreshers about 
Um, you know, these are the indicators of external emails. You know, we always have those clearly indicated at Swift, and I think that's the same at most banks. Um, you don't click on links if they come from external um, sources. And a refresher of, um, you know, what is kind of good uh, remote working um, hygiene. Um, and I think most banks either will be investing or should have already invested in um, secure uh, secure links into confidential um, systems, you know, to enable remote access to, you know, to limit that particular risk as well. <clears throat> right. Thanks, Guy. Uh, one more question has come uh, saying, what is the impact on money laundering? Will the criminals see this as an opportunity? Uh, Subir, I know you touched upon this in uh, one of the answers that you gave. Uh, is it possible for you to maybe expand on this? And Guy, yeah. if you'd like to as well later. Sure. So I think uh, with risk comes reward. So given the the fact that the risk with border being closed is high, hence the premium on laundering will also uh, further increase. And this just I'm not saying you know uh, you know there are press releases from uh, Rusi of of UK where the organized criminal gangs are looking at some of these uh, situations as an opportunity. So clearly the way uh, the the normal business is working on BCP mode, I'm sure the launderers will try to think of new ways and means of running their own business because it's an enterprise also at work. Uh, I think the other aspect is uh, what uh, guy just touched upon, you know, the scams which will go on because if you lose money and, and uh, you know, then you kind of try to place that money back into a bank. That's also laundering, you know, through all of these scams. So that any which ways has increased, you know, a uh, few other uh, issues which we see is uh, gangs getting involved on selling, uh, you know, stuff like masks and medicines on uh, internet which are not genuine uh, uh, trades so again that's also an issue so i think scams will increase at least for the foreseeable time uh, i think that is where the customer education and uh, you know organization security will come to play uh, when you know just a different example when demonetization happened in india you know there was a 50 day period to uh, you know deposit all your currency into the bank so it saw unique unique ways of you know uh, uh, laundering your money so this is not similar situation a totally different situation you have to stay at home you have to operate from your home but what could be the situations which can impact you will evolve all right thanks uh, so we uh, guy any uh, comment on that if not there's another question specifically for you about swift no, I think I think that was a, a very comprehensive answer. I don't I don't have anything tangible to add to that. All right, then let me uh, uh, pose this one to you. Uh, a question re related to the Swift. Uh, he says, as my understanding, all banks use the services of Swift. What are the types of institutions use Swift services uh, for foreign transactions? And does Swift have a designated team to conduct transaction monitoring on all foreign transactions? Um, okay, so do we have a dedicated team that looks after transaction monitoring on all transactions? Um, yeah, especially foreign okay, transactions is what we said. Yeah. Um, so there's foreign transactions. Yeah. Um, in terms of transaction monitoring, as I understand transaction monitoring, um, which is, you know, alerts are generated not because of sanctions risk, um, not because of the people involved in the transaction perhaps, but because of um, behavior-based metrics, rules-based. So it's increased above um, a certain threshold. Um, it's of, uh, there's an unusual volume or spike in that transactional behavior at the account level. That is not something that Swift is doing right now. Uh, we don't have a solution for that. Um, and I can share very directly the reason for that is because we believe that pretty much at the moment, all of the transaction monitoring systems that are out there um, are incredibly inefficient. Um, and I don't think we internally have any particular value to add to that. What we do have, um, looking at things from a slightly different angle, um, is we have additional controls that customers can subscribe to that sit in the network that do fulfill part of a uh, transaction monitoring for, for foreign transactions for your outbound messages, 
that may trigger against well-known um, uh, fraud typologies that we've seen. So we have that from more of a uh, payments fraud prevention perspective. And then the second part of the kind of more future state is SWIFT is really looking at much more of a platform-based strategy moving forward, where we're looking to encapsulate, to look at uh, the, the challenges, be they risk or from a business perspective, of looking at the entirety of the transaction itself, regardless of whether that's even a message or perhaps even um, a uh, for digital currencies, for example. These would all be logged centrally over the SWIFT network, which would enable um, a much greater degree of kind of value add services, be it screening um, or monitoring on top of that. But that's very much future state right now. Right, thanks. Uh, thanks for answering that question, Guy. So that's about all the time we have today for questions. Uh, I would request all the participants to email over any uh, unanswered questions they may have to contact at fintelector.com and we will pass them on to Suvira and Guy and they would respond uh, as and when they get time. Uh, thanks to all the attendees for listening patiently. I hope this webinar was useful and we look forward to bringing you the next Fintelect ABA webinar on the 6th of May where the topic will be sanctions. Uh, Suvira and Guy, thank you for being here with us today and for sharing your thoughts and I wish you the very best. Um, thanks again to my friends, Ernest okay. Lim, thank Amador, you Honrado, and Mick Moreno at the Asian Bankers Association and my colleague Arpita Bedekar at Fintlect for putting this webinar together. So whether you're working from home, office, or some exotic island during this outbreak, have a great day and I look forward to seeing you on the other side of the crisis. Thanks. Thanks, Shadish. Thanks, everyone.